Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to continue our journey at watching 90 Day Fiance, in which we follow Colt, Larissa, Jess, and maybe Eric. And I'm going to watch this show and see if anything of interest comes out of my face. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As I always say, never use these videos or really any video on YouTube as a replacement for therapy. If you need services, get your own individualized services because you deserve it. You really, really do. Let's get to the show. Because we were with her family, I tried to pass it off and ignore it, but I did not appreciate it. And I, I, I saw a different side of her that re reminded me of someone else, and I didn't like it. If she does it again, I'm going to have to step in and say something, because I'm not going to have that. Very disrespectful. And I was just asking a question. I barely remember she did that last night. I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I didn't understand the scenario of what was going on fully. Okay, so he started this scene by saying he's very hungover, and it's the next morning after they had a big fight at Jess's family's house, in which Debbie and Jess got in a big fight. And Debbie is saying, well, I didn't like the way Jess treated me. Now, I think onlookers would say that Debbie was at least half responsible, if not more, for the fight to begin with. But Colt is now saying he doesn't remember the fight because he was so drunk. And in the scene, he didn't look that intoxicated, but you know he could have been, I suppose. So there's two possibilities. One is, is that he legitimately did black out and doesn't remember what happened in that scene. Or he does remember, or at least he remembers enough but is trying to avoid it by acting like he was so drunk he doesn't remember. Which could be in line with the general hypothesis, total speculation I have about the family, is that they've had an ongoing enmeshment for a long time. That for Colt, he's like, well, he wakes up in the morning, he's like, oh boy, okay, so Debbie had this outburst or this argument with Jess, it, it got out of hand, my mom was being aggravating and unfair. My mom is like sure that Jess is not a good partner for me. And I think Jess is a good partner for me. I sent her home. I feel really bad about that. My mom's probably going to give me an earful about that. I don't know what to do. Well, what if I just avoid the whole thing and just say I was so drunk I don't remember any of it? Maybe, maybe then I won't have to talk about it. I don't know. I don't want to accuse Colt of something without knowing, <laughs> but there's a possibility of that. And why would someone do that? Well, someone would do that because of knowing from a track record that mom is rigid and won't listen to him and won't be flexible and might even escalate the rhetoric or the control or the intimidation if he tries to gain some kind of control over the situation. You know, if he sits down and says, mom, I didn't really like the way you dealt with things last night. Uh, I sent you home. I'm sorry that I had to do that. I know that must have felt bad, but you were a very aggravating element in last night that I wasn't helpful. Uh, I'm trying to impress her family. I, I actually really love Jess, and I and she loves me, and we want to explore this relationship. And you're just you're all you're trying to do is make things harder for the two of us. And I'm sorry I sent you home. I didn't know what else to do at the time. I stand by the decision because you were being aggravating and you weren't listening to Jess and you weren't even really listening to me. I mean, I want to be with her. I don't understand why you have to get in the way of that. I, I understand why you're skeptical because it is the beginning of a relationship and it does look suspiciously similar to Larissa. But I'm 34 years old now. I, I want you to respect my decisions. And maybe I am making a big mis mistake. That's one of the things I wish more people would say on this show uh, is, you know what, Debbie, you might be right. I might be making a terrible mistake. This could go terribly wrong. It could be as worse as Larissa or worse. I have no way of predicting the future. All I can do is try to figure out the best course of action given my scenario and given my needs. And right now, I, I think things are going to work out it might not work out. And certainly the signs that you see that point in the direction of it not working out, yeah, I see those signs too. 
But I see a lot of other signs that you don't see because you're not there when me and Jess are together that point in the direction that things are going to go well. I, I wish people on the show would have that perspective instead of just getting so defensive or j acting, I, I don't know, but acting like you're, you're so drunk you don't remember. So if he avoids it, then he doesn't have to have that conversation, which I'm guessing for him might be overwhelming for him. I don't know. It's interesting. Let's continue watching. I thought you should at least defend me to I'm, maybe say something because it's very disrespectful to your mother. Okay, it's a similar messaging that he gives to Jess. There's a lot of parallels. We see for the mom, she's now saying, you did not defend me. You did not take my side. You opposed me last night. And that's disrespectful to your mother. So one could say it's playing the mother card, right? And for Colt, he did that to Jess in that scene in the car a while back where he says, when we were with your friends, you let them interrogate me and we, I need to come first. It's, it's great that you have friends, but I need to come first. So he's playing the boyfriend card. Now, nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm your mother, I want respect. Or, hey, I'm your boyfriend, I want respect. But there is something destructive and harmful to others when you use that in a way to suppress their individuality, to suppress what they want, to get them to comply against their will, then we're looking at a high control, potentially abusive situation. A little drunk, she gets a little like more, like, more extreme, more happy or more sad or more angry, you know? Yeah. So I need you to pay attention to what these signs that are hitting you in the face that you're not acknowledging. So you need to know that they're out there. Yeah. I think that um, he's caught up in a situation where she's taking advantage of him. I think Cole is making exactly the same mistake that he made before. So this is interesting. She's saying, you need to watch out. Jess is a bad person. And Colt is like, yeah, I, I guess I do. I don't think Colt is agreeing with that. I think he's just placating his mom. I don't know, though. Maybe he is going along with it. I guess we'll find out. So systemic thinkers, meaning we look at systems instead of individuals and how systems develop and develop into stable systems, they seem to have a stable system, a homeostasis, if you will, where the mom is dominant and Colt listens and placates, but inside does not go along with what his mom is saying, but ultimately complies and goes along with her. So from the outside, it, you could look at Debbie and you'd be like, what's wrong with Debbie? How come Debbie does that? Debbie is a bad person. She's being controlling. But if you zoom out and you see how the system operates, you see right here this little, this little moment where he is agreeing with her. So she doesn't have any reason to believe she's supposed to change her attitude or her behavior because the person she loves agrees with her, even though he probably doesn't really agree with her. So because he's not honest, because he doesn't feel he has the ability to be honest, or because he might even passive aggressively be not talking much to her about how he really feels, meaning that he wants to be hostile, but he can't do it directly, so he does it in a passive hidden way by withdrawing emotionally from her and placating her, but secretly hating her. That's a typical or one of the ways in which people will express passive hostility. By the two of them participating in that dance, they both create what we see. That Debbie is creating it by not listening and by just imposing her wishes on him. And he, he participates in the dance by not being honest with how he feels and potentially passive hostility. And I still hold my hypothesis that I threw out earlier. And it's this is a total shot in the dark. There's a lot of things I would have to have confirmed for me, i.e. them, they would have to confirm this for me, particularly Colt. But my hypothesis, if I were to treat a family like this, would, would be that Colt actually has tremendous hostility towards his mom. And f for his entire life, he's never felt like he could express it. And the way that he expresses it 
is indirectly by finding women that might not like her, Debbie, and then Colt might even socialize his partner to attack her because he wants to attack his mom for a lifetime of feeling dominant and over-controlled and discounted, but he can't do it, so he finds people to date who he thinks will actually attack the mom. But also, as he's going out with these women, he actually kind of feeds them information or slightly does things or stays out of the fight when they, when they really start going at it because he actually subconsciously wants someone to attack his mom, but he doesn't feel like he can do it. That's a total stretch of what we're seeing, but I've seen that before. This is something that actually does happen in real life and can create all sorts of problems. Now, what the solution is, is not like, well, let's attack Debbie. What the solution is, is that everyone's trying to get their needs met. Debbie is trying to have a relationship with her son. Nothing wrong with that. Colt is trying to have a relationship with his mom. Nothing wrong with that. Colt is also trying to have a relationship with Jess. Nothing wrong with that. Jess is trying to have a relationship with Colt and kind of with the mom. Nothing wrong with that. How can they do that in a way that doesn't trigger each other, cause hurt or fear that cause them to, you know, go to other things to layer on, to, you know, obscure their pain, become hostile, become controlling, and then they trigger each other. And then this vicious cycle just happens all over. Anyway, let's continue watching. Hey, Deserving Listeners, as you know, I'm constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. One of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp.com. So if you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to BetterHelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the slash Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it helps us out. I get a lot of emails from you saying that you're looking for a therapist. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist but I know it can be really hard to find a good one to work with. Like I said, one of the options available to try is betterhelp.com slash Kirk. And you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide, which is amazing. I've been told that you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message with your counselor anytime. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. And I've been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month of therapy today. You don't know her. You don't know hardly anything about her. Yeah. You did this last time, and when you finally got together, it was a totally different relationship. I don't know where this is all going, but I'm spending time with her now. But I don't understand why she's wants to get married, like, tomorrow. Do you want to get married that quick? Okay, so given what we've seen, that question on the surface seems like a very innocent question. Do you want to get married that quick? It's a simple question. People might ask that of any family or friend or something. Oh, you seem to be moving real quick. Do you want to get married that quick? So it could be that innocent of a question. But there could also be other messages in there. Other messages, given their potential hypothesized enmeshment. Another question in there is, are you really going to move forward with distancing yourself from me? Are you really going to oppose me? Are you really going to throw our entire relationship and our family out the window? Are you really going to hurt me that much with your attitude with your heart? Are you really going to destroy me in this? Now, I don't know, but I'm guessing that that is being communicating and received. Let's rewatch that. Understand why she wants to get married like tomorrow. Do you want to get married that quick? I don't know. And then there, I wonder, a total speculation, if he is saying to the mom, I, I don't know. Yeah, may, maybe I do want to separate from you. Maybe I am ready to finally 
distance myself from you. Maybe I am ready to not be as involved with you as we have been. Maybe I am prepared to hurt you in this way. I don't know. And I don't know <laughs> if that's what's being communicated or thought that I'm really having to read between the lines. But I wouldn't be surprised if that's what's happening. In family therapy, we have this thing called metacommunication, meaning uh, you know, communicating about communicating. And, and also, there's a lot of theories about communication is the idea. And when you're in families, and if you just take the verbatim sentences and statements that are made to each other, that's one layer of communication. But often, particularly in tense situations, 99% of what's being actually communicated, meaning what the ideas you're trying to convey and what ideas are being absorbed or heard or received from the other person, 99% of the communication is unsaid. It's between the lines, it's implied, it's in the tone of the voice, it's in the context. And so I would be very curious if I could really drill down on this family and say, mom, when you say, do you wanna marry that soon? What are you communicating? What do you hope to communicate? Because that's the other thing is that it's people often have these hopes that they're communicating something and it actually isn't received that way. For her, by asking that question, she might hope that he receives the message that she cares, that she loves him and she wants to protect him as any mother would want to protect their son, regardless of how old he is. She's hoping that he can see that she cares and that she loves him. She might also hope, I'm guessing, that he can realize that he doesn't know her that well and that for his own sake, he should probably be more careful, maybe give it some more time. That might be probably what she's trying to communicate. She might also be trying to communicate it, if we could drill down very, really far, that she's trying to communicate, I don't have anyone else in my life, Colt, and without you, I have nobody. And I don't think anyone else will want to be with me. I don't think anyone else will want to hang out with me. I don't think anyone else will care about me. So that's another thing I'm trying to communicate there. Then we could go to Cole and say, when your mom asked you that question, what did you think was being communicated to you? I'm guessing that there would be some misunderstanding there. And this is something that systems relational therapists spend a lot of time with is in that communi unspoken communication zone and what's intended to be communicated and what's being received is often not accurate. And so for him, he might be getting well. What, what I'm getting from my mom is that she just doesn't, really know the situation or she just doesn't like Jess. She just has a thing against Jess. She just made up her mind and she doesn't want me to marry Jess because she's, she's prejudiced against, against Jess as a human. And I might ask him, well, do you hear all those other messages that your mom was hoping you would receive? And I'm, I'm guessing you'd be like, no, I didn't receive any of that stuff. And helping people to communicate about those things more directly can often really help because when you know what someone is trying to tell you, then you, oh, that's what you meant by that? I thought you meant this. And then you can address that and have empathy for each other. And when there's mutual empathy, then you feel more secure and there's less need for dominance and control. I feel like I am the only one that's gonna stop Colt from marrying her right away. I just don't, I'm afraid to leave them alone because I'm afraid they're gonna run off and get married. And, and I don't think Colt is thinking straight. I can't stop thinking. It's just a very interesting attitude that she has. I mean, if you heard what she said, she says, I'm afraid to leave them alone because I'm worried they're going to run off and get married. So that implies that she believes she has the power to stop them from getting married, which she doesn't have that power as far as I can tell. I mean, I guess she has some sort of influence, but I don't think it's working this time. So... It's an interesting attitude that she has and points to a history in this relationship that might have involved a similar attitude. I don't know. We'd have to ask them. About why it's so important so quick. Pay attention to what Jess is doing and see if she gets defensive because I'm going to ask her again. I think my mother is overreacting about last night and she's already decided that Jess is just bad for me. And at the same time, Jess has to understand that my mother's opinion about our relationship is very important to me. 
So I'm feeling caught in the middle. Once again, and how you deal with being caught in the middle, Colt, is very important. As I've been saying from the beginning, when I first saw Larissa and Debbie fighting seasons ago, the uh, a recommended approach is to validate each person and prevent them from directly fighting because they're both fighting about you. And so you need to say, hey, mom, don't yell at Jess. Yell at me. Don't, don't yell at Jess, okay? You don't know her. If you have a problem with us being together, talk to me because I'm your son and it, we know each other. You don't know Jess. She doesn't deserve to be yelled at like that. But you can talk to me about it. So talk directly to me. And then you go to Jess and you're saying, I can see that you're hurt. And it makes sense that you're hurt. My mom, I, and I don't know what to say about the way she is. And you're right to be hurt. You're right to be angry. You're right to be concerned. And I hear you. You, you, just va you validate both people and you go to Jess and you say, please do not attack my mom. If you have a concern, tell me about it. Now, that would be the first step to get sort of a, a, a structure around that of like, don't fight with each other. Uh, let's talk with me one on one. Then eventually what you would want is that Jess and Debbie could actually interact directly. But how would that work? Because <laughs> that is the optimal situation is where people are talking directly to each other and not using an intermediary like that. But I'm just trying to imagine how that would work. I I'm guessing that if, if they felt validated by Colt and heard by him, that they would calm down quite a bit and the resentment would go down and then they could actually communicate to each other without all the anger. I don't know. There's a lot of resentment already at play, and these people barely know each other, so. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.